It's such a joy to welcome you here in Reykjavik today. Um, we met some of us last night at Hubley House, and I know that many of you are here for the first time. Um, if you were wondering why this important forum is held in Reykjavik, I hope that the President's opening remarks gave you some light in both what we have to hopefully share with you from the experience that we have had in the last four years or so, and also what we can learn from this wonderful group. Um, in the next two hours or so, we will go through this first session of the forum. We have chosen the heading Inspiring, and I hope that we will live up to that um, aspiration. It's divided into four parts, and we will be exploring the crash, the crisis, the collapse, whatever you call it, that happened in Iceland in 2008. Uh, what it meant to us, what lessons we learned, or should have learned perhaps, and um, how the community, society, tried collectively to re-examine the values, both as a society and also as individuals, because like what Saba said here in the beginning, which is so absolutely true, if we do not change ourselves, if we do not feel the real values ourselves, how can we hope to inspire others and change our communities? So, we can talk a lot, and like the President said, we can talk all day or maybe all week about uh, the crisis in Iceland and what can be learned from it. There were successes, but there were also failures, and we definitely do not have all the answers, even though we have tried to find a new way forward, a new common ground. <coughs> what we have asked our contributors here today, in the next couple of hours or so, to do, is basically to approach the issues bearing three things in mind. Number one is honesty. Number two, humility. Number three, last but not least, some humor. <laughs> so, Andre, you're going to use the next 10 minutes or so to tell us the Iceland saga. It's no small task to do this in 10 minutes. Uh, and I remember when I, when I called you and asked you to participate in the forum, you were very quick to respond and uh, said, yes, absolutely, you would do so. But you said, there are three important issues, that immediately, there are three important issues that come to mind after I had explained what the forum was all about. You said, it's the fear of change, the desire to hold on to an army, and the need to continue to build dams and power plants. I give you this for the next 10 minutes, aren't you? This is uh, product placement. This is from my story. <laughs> I'm not going to uh, tell you the story, but it's uh, it's kind of a metaphor in my story. This guy he puts a nail in the sun, and it has some consequences. So uh, what I kind of wanted to do here was maybe to throw out some metaphors, some concepts that we could maybe discuss in the next uh, two days and uh, lessons to be learned and from both our success and failure and just how we interact with things here in Iceland. Uh, and of course I forgot to say uh, hello to our honorary guests and uh, the president and John Knarr and your hands. So uh, Iceland had uh, a military base for 50 years here in Iceland and uh, this divided the nation in, in politics, and, uh, but it was very important economically. I think in the last years we got like one or two hundred billion dollars in, uh, in, in foreign revenue for, uh, for the base, and we had about two thousand people working in the base. But like some of you know, the Cold War ended, and uh, for some reason the superpowers were not going to throw nuclear bombs on each other for a while, and uh, there was no need for the base anymore. But that was a problem, because 2,000 people were working in the place. And, uh, and the uh, news reporters, they would go to the base site and say, now the base is obsolete. 
and they would speak to a person and the person would say, this is horrible, my life is over. And somebody else would say, this is not socially responsible, they just can't leave. Uh, it's uh, unethical to close down the banks. And this kind of spread into our politics, and quite a lot of our politics went into the foreign politics, went into trying to keep the base open. But the Americans, they have some military specialists, and they said, but who is your enemy? <laughs> uh, so we kind of scratched our heads and we said, uh, there is hope in the future, we might have enemies. <laughs> you never know. So uh, we could not close down the base like creative uh, people, just say, this is okay, you can leave, thanks for the... Thank, thanks for the communication. Thank you. Uh, we'll do something else because we're creative. And this showed us how the concept of language is telling us you are a product of a base, your life depends on a base, the base is the source of your living, but not you are the person that creates the base and because you can keep the base running, you could keep almost anything running that is going on in the world because the base is quite complex. So I thought if the world would, uh, if world peace, like from here, if somebody would open a bottle and it would spread like a virus around the planet, world peace would just spread like some plague around the planet and nobody would see any reason to kill each other anymore, and all the bases would have to close down, then we would see headlines like this. <laughs> threatens local economy, what should we do now? And uh, this brings us to this, this fact of how we put our responsibility to politicians, how we don't believe in our own creativity, how we cling on to obsolete things, it could be a car factory, it could be an obsolete factory, it could be an obsolete way of living, how we cling on to these things and we don't want to overstep until we meet a, a real wall, a, a physical a physical, oops, uh, physical thing that we can't go over. <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, so, another thing that has kind of determined our politics is, uh, is this. There was a big problem in Iceland because we solved our problem. We completely fulfilled our need for energy. We had geothermal energy in most of our houses. We had uh, even already built dams that were twice, produced twice the amount of energy that, that the nation could actually use. That we had an, a dam up in, in northern Iceland, about 100 megawatts, and there was no need for it, they just built it. So this was a problem for our engineers, because what does a 40-year-old engineer in 1985 or 1990 do when he has solved the problem? Thank you, you can go home, you solve the problem. So, they found this uh, excellent... <laughs> so, they found the solution to their problem, and they found the problem. So, this is kind of how Iceland could have been after solving the problem. We had, would have dammed a few rivers, and, uh, and no need for anything else. The rest could be a national park, which could enjoy it and just live and be happy. But then they found this. This is an aluminum smelter and it uses uh, about energy like about one million people. So when a politician gets a smelter to come to Iceland, suddenly we have to expand the infrastructure of our energy system like the nation just quadrupled in, uh, in, uh, in a span of four years. So therefore, about 1980, not 19, uh, around the year 2000 and uh, Six, the plan looked kind of like this. Alcoa was going to use most of the energy in the north and the east, and uh, most of the energy in the south was going to uh, three aluminum smelters. And this was really revolutionary because suddenly people had to be worried about waterfalls like this one here. Uh, this area is gone now. We had to struggle for this area here. Uh, this area here we had to tell people that it actually exists, and then tell people that they should want to preserve it. This area here, Longkishore, 
We took people for walks to show them the places, let them experience them. This waterfall here does not exist anymore, it's making aluminum in eastern Iceland. Not, this one is under uh, a reservoir now. So many artists here in Iceland, this caused great unrest within the Icelandic population, because many artists, they thought, why am I creating anything when they're destroying something that is much more great than I could ever create in my own life as an artist? So, the problem was, and this also goes for the, most of the geothermal areas on, around Reykjavik here, which are under threat from an aluminum smelter here in southern Iceland. So we went from being in a perfect situation into being in some kind of a dystopia, but the problem is that when the billion dollars for a new smelter poured into the economy, it caused a boom. We were told we had to sacrifice nature for the economy, but actually, we sacrificed nature and the economy, which is very interesting. And we were addicted to the cycle to be constantly building a dam, but not to have built a dam. To be constantly building a smelter, but not to have built a smelter. So this caused the environmental organizations in Iceland to expand and become one of the biggest grassroots movements in Iceland. And long before the crash, we had protests with about 20,000 people walking down Leovir, one of our streets here. So, the politicians would ask... So this comes to uh, the conclusion of why the pyramids in Egypt are three. <laughs> why are they three? That's because you cannot build one pyramid. If you have all your resources of your country and you have like 40,000 people building a pyramid for 40 years, the most obvious thing to do is to build another pyramid. <laughs> because that's what you're doing, that is your economy, that's the point of everything. So, uh, we built this pyramid up in, in uh, the eastern part of Iceland, and they wanted to build another one, but the crash came, and uh, there has been a host in this for almost uh, six years now, in, in building all these uh, huge mega projects. And uh, it's been kind of a relief for many. <clears throat> but if you look at just like this industry, it wants to grow, even in a world of finite resources, where the, we have met kind of the end of growth. Uh, industry like this wants to grow three times from uh, 1998. So what do we do instead? And this is actually what the environmental groups had to do in Iceland. We had to address this problem, what can we do instead? And that's the problem, because if you ask a musician, Okay, you're a musician, but what song are you going to make next time? You know, he can't say that. We just know we want to exist and create and uh, keep on going. For example, uh, one of the best companies in Iceland made the spare legs for Pistorius that you saw in the Olympic Games. If somebody asked me 15 years ago when I said, oh, why don't we just make uh, spare legs for amputated people so they can run in 100 meters in the Olympics, for example. You know, I would be called uh, a madman. <laughs> but what happened here in Iceland is that the environmental organizations teamed up with the startup companies, the, the small grassroots organizations. And uh, so this was not only kind of the fire that went directly into protests, but uh, this would create endless small infrastructures of grassroots organizations where it became, <clears throat> where it became almost uh, a virtue to be making a startup company. So not only it went into uh, protest, but to be making a startup company, to lose your job, was not seen as the end of your life. And this kind of grassroots or infrastructure or, or paradigm, I think this had a major effect of catching the uh, the crisis when very talented people were losing their jobs and, and this would uh, kind of be one of the most interesting things that we could maybe speak about is how the idea of possibilities and how the joy of creation into business, into arts, into music and how the environmental organization fused in with, with these industries. I think this is something that uh, has created uh, 
very, very seeds for the future and will be something that we will see in the next 10 years as seen as a starting point for many of our most beautiful companies for running amputated people or, or something like that. Thank you. Joining us later uh, here on the lounge, so there will be an opportunity to explore some of the, uh, the points that you raised. Uh, Ingrid, um, you were involved in an incredibly interesting, what shall I say, experience or project, but something that took place in Iceland in, in 2009, in November. We called it the National Assembly, and it was an attempt to lead together as many people as possible to get a, a spectrum of the nation to find the common values, to uh, pull the uh, common wisdom, and, and find a way forward. And am I right in saying that this, this event might have been a startup of what is now going to be a, a general election, of an advisory election on the 20th of October on a new constitution, or some, some proposals at least for a new constitution? Yes, you're absolutely right. And it was an incredible day. It was one of the most well, remarkable days in my life, apart from the birth of my two children, because, well, it created optimism, it created momentum, positivity, and it was a very unique and inspiring experiment. I was very fortunate to be part of that experiment. And it was a grassroots initiative organized by a non-partisan group of people that called themselves the Ant Hill. And the name refers to the, the fact that an ant hill has a collective wisdom that an individual, each individual ant, doesn't have. And it was probably one of the first meetings, first events that was, well, where we had a statistically representative sample of a single nation trying to find common values and a common vision for their future. We had 1,500 participants, which means that it involved about 1.5% of the Icelandic population. It was a unique experience, social experiment. And what happened was that we invited 1,200 people. They were, were, were randomly selected from the National Registry, 18 years and up. And we also invited 300 people, they were specially invited, they were representatives of, for example, parliament, organizations and institutions in Iceland. And the reason that we invited those 300 people was that we wanted those people to go home and to go to their immediate environment and spread the word, because we were very afraid that if we would have help hold a meeting, and not have these people present that they wouldn't understand what had happened at that meeting. And the National Assembly, well, we, you have to understand the situation in Iceland at that time. Why was there a need to sit down and talk about values, talk about our vision for a country? If we take a look at the situation, of course, uh, when Iceland plunged into financial crisis, all of the common ideologies and principles that the country had rested on for three decade, decades or more, they were just, well, they vanished nearly overnight. And the common principles, well, they were just leveled to the ground. So the country was bankrupt in more than one ways. And we had to find, well, we had to reset the conference. We had to create a new roadmap for the future. And of course, People were also very frustrated. People were angry. We had had demonstrations where people were arguing and shaking their fists in the sky. And we had had civic meetings, action meetings. And we also had the kitchenware revolution. It's named after the pots and pans that Icelanders used to as noisemakers. And this revolution, it led eventually to the collapse of the government in January 2009. So you have to understand the background of the situation here in Iceland. And a lot of people said that, well, going out and demonstrating, that's not my cup of tea. We'll have to find a different way. We'll have to try to do something constructive, something positive. And that's why this group of people, the Ant Hill, they sat down and they said, how can we 
well, create new values? How can we make a new set of principles for our country? And, well, that's how it started. And also people have been, well, they have been complaining about a lack of action from their authorities. And we, it was like we were all just waiting for something to happen. So it was time to push up our sleeves to take control, to be proactive and to actually do something. And like I said, this assembly, it was a very special event. We had 1,500 participants and we had 162 tables. So we had nine people at each table and 162 tables, 162 well-trained facilitators. They received extensive training to be able to facilitate and manage the flow at all the tables. And then we had 18 zone masters. I was one of the 18 zone masters and we were responsible for managing those group facilitators in our zone. And there were two masters of, of ceremony. So all, when all these people came together, something special happened. I'm not going to talk in, in, in great length about the process and the methodology of the, the assembly, but a couple of things. Um, one of the things that is very important is that it's a very democratic process. We did a lot of voting during the day, and this is very important. I remember that one of the participants, he was very frustrated. He sat down in the beginning of the meeting and he immediately said, I have the solution for Iceland's problem. So the other participant said, okay, what's your solution? And he said, well, Iceland should only be for Icelanders. So all foreigners should just go home. And the other participants, they didn't know how to react. But the process, the methodology of the meeting is very democratic. So he just wrote down this idea, he put it on a piece of paper, we used yellow cards during the meeting, he sat down and he wrote it down. But then what happened during the voting process was that his idea just didn't get any votes. So there was no need to discuss it any further. And the process is also, it's, it's very constructive. Participants only represent themselves. And the goal is to get as many viewpoints as possible. Like Swan had said, it's all about collective wisdom, collective intelligence, like the ant hill. We have to make sure that everyone can have a say and everyone had opinions. And it was very nice to see people working together because they were, these were people that had never met before. Nine people, nine strangers sat down and they were teenagers, they were single mothers, they were elderly gentlemen and they sat down together and they talked about their nation's future. And I remember that at one table we had an 18-year-old teenager and next to him sat a woman who had just turned 80. And they just became best friends. It was absolutely wonderful to see. So it's a democratic process and everyone has the same right to express his opinions. I remember that we had some concerns before the assembly started because we invited those 300 well, representatives from parliament and, and organizations and institutions in, in Iceland, and we were afraid that they might be too dominating. But that was not the case, because when people entered the sports arena where the event was held, well, they were all nothing but Icelanders. So they all had the same say. And the participants, they, well, they took an active part. It was very nice to see during the day. Like I said, they were all strangers, but they became good friends and people were taking group photographs at the end of the meeting and they were hugging and some people shed some tears. It was absolutely wonderful to see. Um, we had well-trained facilitators. This is very important. They were neutral. They were not supposed to take a stand or express their own opinions. Their only job was to manage the flow at the tables and to make sure that everything well, went well and also that people felt comfortable, independent, and had a positive attitude. And what we did was, during the first half of the session, before lunch, we asked participants to describe a, val a value, to mention, to name a single value, one word that would describe the values, the, the, the principles that Iceland's, Icelandic society should be based on. 
a value, uh, uh, an emotion, a virtue, one word. I'm going to show you what the representatives at the National Assembly said. It's in Icelandic, but you see the English words too. The thing that people valued most was honesty or integrity. And other very important values that were mentioned were equal rights, respect and justice. And they also mentioned things like love and freedom, sustainability, responsibility and trust. And of course, if you take a look at these values, it's very clear to me that they might have featured a very critical view of the Icelandic society at that point in time. Why did we choose a thing like honesty or integrity? Well, the cross ownership and the corruption that had gone on for years in Iceland was suddenly laid bare for everyone to see. So now we wanted integrity. And why did we choose justice? Well, we chose justice because we wanted those who had contributed to the meltdown of the Icelandic, Icelandic economy behind bars. We wanted justice. And we also chose trust, for example, because there was very little trust in Iceland at that point in time. And of course, when a meeting like this is held, it creates a lot of expectations and desires for things to change. And I know that a lot of people were, well, they were frustrated after the meeting. Because they said it's very nice to, to have decided on those values, but what's the next step? It would have been vague. But it's very important to bear in mind that the, the, the organizing team, the Ant Hill, their goal was not to determine specific stances on issues or to determine policies or strategies. Their goal was first and foremost to get the debate started. And I think, well, we did a great job just doing that. After lunch, we discussed the, the pillars that the meeting had decided before lunch, things like economy, welfare, environment, family, and so on. And there's a couple of things there that were very, well, very important. The first thing that people, very many people at the meeting mentioned was that they wanted added transparency and they also wanted improved business ethics, which is again not strange in the light of the corruption that had been taking place in Iceland that came to light. And, well, they also wanted more diversity. They wanted, well, like Andre talked about, they wanted more entrepreneurship and they also wanted more innovation. And one of the things that people mentioned were, was about the resources. They wanted Iceland's national resources, resources to, to be protected at all times. So these are only, uh, well, it's a small summary of what the meeting, what came out of this meeting. And of course, well, holding a meeting is one, but then what happens? And oh, it's very, I'm very proud to, to tell you that over 150 events have been organized where the methodology and the process of the National Assembly have been used. And there are still events going on here in Iceland. And like Svanhild mentioned, the Icelandic government decided to kick off the revision of the Icelandic constitution in 2010 by holding a similar event, a national assembly. So a lot of things have happened. And, and for example, next week, I'm going to lead a national assembly in one of our workplaces here in Iceland. So we're still using and, of course, also improving this methodology. But, like I said, there was so much joy, there was inspiration. I think this meeting was a very important step in the, in the grieving in Iceland after the financial crisis. Like I said, people came to us, they had tears in their eyes, they thanked us for having organized that meeting. And I think people left with more positivity. They felt that they could finally go on and do something. And to summarize it, I'm going to show you a very small impression of the National Assembly. It's about one minute. Enjoy.